Hosting for the Dice Tower is generously provided by Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff, in stock at CoolStuffInc.com. Thanks for your support. The Dice Tower, Episode 481. Sports vs. Games. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On today's show, we serve gumbo in Ludwig's Castle. We bring a classic Sid Saxon deduction game to the cult of the old, and we dissect Medici. Plus, some questions from the mailbag, a tale of board gaming horror, and we explore the age-old question of the difference between sports and games. I'm Eric Summerer, and here's your host, the John McEnroe of board gaming, Tom Vassell. All right. I don't know what you're talking about at all. You've never heard of John McEnroe? Maybe. Think hard. No, I'm not going to play this game here. i do not going to make knowledge come to my head. Is this a sports guy? A sports commentator? He is, he is a sports commentator. He used to play sports. What, One what, in particular. What? Well, it wasn't baseball. It wasn't baseball. Well, then I don't care. Tennis. Wow. Of all the sports I care the least about, you picked tennis. Lots of people like tennis. Yes, I know Venus and Serena Williams. And that is I it. saw so it, it just oh, and, this and, is and a, Agassi. This is a little bit of a tangent, but I was watching German television while we were in Germany, and I saw a, a talk show where they had a, a little German girl and Boris Becker, and they had them both uh, like listening to Wimbledon matches, like the last 10 seconds of a Wimbledon match. And after hearing this, they had to name what the match was, who the contestants were, who, who the players were, who won, and what the score was, just listening to the last 10 seconds of the match. And this little girl got a perfect score, and Boris Becker got all but one crazy okay but do you feel and i i maybe i shouldn't be able to this point because it it would be bad for me but do you feel like i should have known who this person was you should have known who john McEnroe was yes it is why are they the most famous tennis player in the world i don't i don't know he was quite famous he he was uh infamous really for like yelling at umpires i don't know anything about tennis okay it's all right why did you pick you. a baseball guy? A baseball is the sport. What? Why did you pick tennis? I, I dislike baseball. See, hmm. everybody loves tennis. I could have picked a curler and really thrown you off. I don't know that curling is a sport, but all right. Oh, whoa! Hey, ho, whoa! <laughs> hold on. <laughs> hey, hey! Remember the fantasy, Final fantasy tactics thing from last game. <laughs> so don't don't become what you hate, Eric. <laughs> Wait a second here. All right, we need to move on. Hi, I'm Eric Summer. I'm Tom Basso. We're actually talking about board games. Um, And as obvious, it may seem like we don't know much about sports, which is actually true, although I do know a lot about at least historical baseball. I really, really, really like the sport of baseball comparatively, but don't know much about any other sports. Um, But anyway, we're here to talk about board games. Now, last time we talked about hot S and games. Here's how this works. We record our shows in pairs, so we're recording this show <laughs> the same time we record last one. And I just want to give you a heads up that we may have wasted all the hotness. <laughs> because we wanted to get those out as quickly as possible. Right. So just – we're not saying these games are all bad today. We're just saying they may not be as hot. <laughs> hey, my first game, I, as far as I know, sold out at Essen, so – It might have been three copies. You can't use that sold out moniker. Sure. Uh, the, the first one I want to talk about is a new Haba game uh, called Hamster Banda, which is a hamster clan. It is, uh, it's a cooperative game about collecting food for the winter. The object is to get, uh, so based on the number of players, if you have three players, you have to get three clovers, three carrots, and three uh, wheat tokens from the top of the board into the storage sections of the board before all of the leaves fall off of the tree and uh and winter has arrived winter is coming 
You do this through a simple roll and move mechanism. You roll the die and you can move that number of spaces trying to get uh, your, your little hamster tokens to where they need to go. The board is uh, basically a, a big, uh, ma- not really a maze, but uh, burrows, underground burrows for these hamsters. And it includes movable sections that represent a hamster wheel, an elevator, a gondola, and like a railroad car, a mine car, that you can ride on to get to different sections of the board. Uh, If you manage to collect all of the tokens before time runs out, you win, and if not, you have to try again next time. Uh, My kids really liked the toy factor of this game. They were making noises as we were going on the elevator and uh, just really enjoyed making all of the pieces move, which is really the draw of this game, because when it comes right down to it, you're rolling a die and moving that number of spaces. There aren't a whole lot of things you can do if you're just rolling ones throughout the course of the game. There is a mechanism where you can pass tokens to another player, and I think effectively doing that is the key to the game. But if you're just rolling a bunch of ones, there's still not a lot you can do. So my kids really loved this. They were really with it. I think they're going to be asking to play it for some time. Me, I was not really engaged with this game. Because it's basically roll and move, I I didn't feel like I had any control over it. And even the spaces with the movable pieces, the wheel and the cart, there's no real strategy to using them other than not wanting to block off. You don't want to stop on the cart if another player wants to go past you because they won't be able to do so. So uh, the kids like it, but I don't. That's Hamster Bond from Haba. Well, I'm going to make Eric feel better by talking about a game that no one likes. Oh. Um, no, not really. Actually, I've seen a lot of positive comments about it. And then I played the game. And that game is War Quest. Now, War Quest is from designer Glenn Drover. It's from Mr. B Games, uh, Tropical Games. And I was pumped about playing it. Glenn Drover designed a whole ton of games back in the day from Eagle Games. This is before Eagle Griffin. When Eagle first came on the scene, they essentially made just a pile of big, giant war games with plastic pieces. Think Axis and Ally style. Yeah. And there was Attack was probably the most famous one, but there was War. Um, there was uh, a civil American Civil War game, and there was just several of these games. And they were not bad games, although I would probably not rank any of them very highly today because most of them haven't held up well. And they have sort of like 80s mechanisms in them. And we're now in the year 2016. Well, that's kind of where WarQuest is. Hmm. WarQuest has this concept where you are this warlord and you are going around recruiting different uh, units from the elves, from the dwarves, etc. into your army and you go around and you um, go fight battles with other people. Well, that sounds good in concept. The miniatures are really nice. Now... The gameplay itself, though, is pretty bad. First of all, silly things like the rules say, place the units in their homeland. And I was like, um, oh, well, I think this is an orc. Hmm. I, I think orcs go here because there's a picture of the orc in the woods. And most of them were pretty easy to figure out where they went, but that was really... It was really not an easy game to set up. The rules are not very well put together. And Hmm. the worst thing of all is that all these different units have special abilities, and they're listed in the rules, but there's no reference card at all for this stuff. That's Mm. bad. Bad, 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 bad. Now, uh, where the game, though, is awful and makes me want to spew is that combat is rolling six-sided dice that have a hit on one of the sides. Oh, man. Yes. So you get these – the combat has this kind of almost convoluted thing. It's like, all right, put all your guys – who are you putting in the front line? Put your range guys in the back line. Range people fire first and the people in the front line fire first. And there's a hit on one side of the six-side die and there's a retreat on one side. And that retreat might make you go back and it might make you go forward. And so – I mean it might make you retreat and then your guy can rally someone to make them go forward again. <laughs> and – but that hit on one six-sided die is awful odds. Eric might roll ten dice, and I might roll three, and I literally might get two hits, and he might get none because Ugh. of that. You know, that's a crazy swings, and battles are like super long and random. 
And then you can send your warlords off on quests that, that will get them points and possibly really cool weapons and things and just mostly points for the game. And you go on a quest, you will fight a monster in that quest, and you essentially both roll the six-sided die until someone wins. That's hmm. really bad. It, I, the game is long. It encourages killing people. For example, you get points every time you win a battle. Okay, that's fine. Games do that. I like that. It encourages attacking. So I attack Eric, and I'm beating Eric up. So Eric has two options. To stay there and fight to the death and lose all his troops or to retreat. So he retreats and then Sally's like, well, why not? Eric's army is right there. I get points for attacking and winning. Why would I not destroy this pitiful little army? So mm. she attacks and Eric retreats again. And then and then uh, Susan's like, well, I'm going to take J- Eric out now. And she does. And we all are happy except for one player. That player's name is Eric. Mm-hmm. It's It's... It might have been good in the 80s, but it is not good today. Hmm. The miniatures are really good. Nice little miniatures, but it is just an unplayable mess. It's also long. There's no narrative. You just kind of run around on the board and attack each other. There's no reason Hmm. to hold things. I mean, you get a card that says, hold this at the end of the game. Yeah, but I don't need to hold it now, so I'll just march around my army. (laughs) Um, So... Sorry, I cannot recommend this one, folks. All right. That is War Quest. Well, let's talk about a game that's a good bit smaller, and I guess it sounds like more fun. Uh, this is Jurass Attack. J U R A S S A T T A C K. I'm still it, not on board with the name of this game. It just it's a little wonky of a name. Maybe. Uh, it is a two-player game about dinosaur battles, uh, and each player starts with an identical deck. But you don't see all of that deck at once. You'll draw a certain number of cards, and then you face down, uh, sort of blind bidding, place uh, one of these cards down. Actually, it it's, can be multiple cards, because some of these cards can pair up with each other. Not all of them can, because uh, there's certain rules, like the T-Rex doesn't like to work with anybody else, but some of the others can can uh, join up and, and be a stronger force together. You can also stick egg cards in with your bid, for a lack of a better term, with your, your other dinosaurs, and if you manage to win that, uh, that battle, you can score that egg, which is worth points at the end of the game. Uh, Based on who wins, uh, players will be able to capture cards that go in their score pile. Now, the winner of a battle does not get to refill their hand, whereas the loser can. So the balance sort of shifts back and forth a little bit. Who's who's got the advantage and who's more likely to win the next round because the loser is going to get to refill their hand. Choosing when you want that to happen is important. And when do you put out your big strong guys with the big T-Rexes and and who's going to win that battle? Um, I found it to be an interesting game. Uh, it, It had some, a few cool choices as to when to deploy your more powerful cards. When do you save? It's the the compies, uh, the the little dinosaurs that mesh up together. And if you play more of them at once, they're exponentially more powerful. Uh, So do you hold on to those for a little while and hope you get a few more in your hand? Or do you strike with them now? When is your opponent going to play something really strong and you can slip in with almost nothing so you can smack them down again after you've refilled your hand? I found it fun. Uh, a, a good time. I, I played this with a buddy, an adult. I have not had a chance to play this with my kids yet. Uh, but I think uh, with Dinosaur Combat, it might be a draw. That's Jurass Attack. I liked it. Yeah, I think this is an excellent two-player game. It's light, it's easy, but it has more strategy in there than you might think. Mm-hmm. Okay, I want to talk about the Dominion upgrades. So a month ago, they announced that they were making Dominion 2nd Edition and Dominion Intrigue 2nd Edition, which was a big surprise to me because, well, there, I hadn't seen any hints towards this. Did you? No, not till they announced it. Yeah, so it was kind of out of the blue. They announced it, and then they were out less than a month after they announced them. Hmm. So I got a hold of both of them, and what they did is they – there's a couple things. First of all – Dominion Intrigue is now just an expansion. It is now no longer a standalone Dominion game. Interesting. Uh, the regular Dominion is the base game now, and they changed the gold cards and, and silver and copper cards in it to match those that were previously found in the money pack or 
basic money upgrade pack that was available. Right. That they look they look slightly different. Like it used to be that the gold, silver, and、uh, copper cards were all the same color. They were, and they don't look slightly different. They look very different. It's、mm. a very good change. But they also did other things, like they put the victory points on the victory point cards in big circles so you can see them. They bolded all the. I mean, they made all the text bigger and easier to see. They、um, changed the word he to they. Hmm. Or his, and his to there, okay. So those are all cosmetic changes, and that's fine. They left the artwork alone, although the moat now has blue water instead of orange water. But、mm-hmm. but the big change they did is they took six cards out and added seven cards to both sets. Interesting. Now you might be sitting there already starting to have your face get red and clenching your fists, but don't do that because these cards are available in an upgrade pack. You do not need to buy another whole copy of the game. Hmm. So if you just want the new cards, you can. And I will say that all the cards that they took out, there's two things. First of all, if you own those cards, I did not find anything in the box that threatened me legally to get rid of the cards I owned. <laughs> you don't actually have to get rid of them. Although I did get rid of a couple.、Um, but、uh, and the new, so the new cards kind of replace the old ones, but they're not like a one to one ratio. They're just some new interesting cards. They also got rid of the saboteur from Dominion Intrigue, which is one of the meanest, nastiest cards in the game. So yes, good riddance to bad rubbish, I say. Although they did add the bandit card in the original Dominion, which is pretty mean too.、Hmm. That one、uh, it costs five, and when you buy it, and when, whenever you play it, you get a gold. And then everyone flips over the top two cards of their deck, and if they have a money card that's not a copper, they have to discard it. Or I mean,、mm. I'm sorry, trash it, not discard it. Ugh. So that one was already in existence with the thief. The thief is one of the cards that they removed, but the thief people didn't take that much because it let you maybe steal from someone. This new one gives you a gold when you play it. Yeah.、So、you're definitely going to play it, and it's one of those cards that when it shows up, everyone just keeps buying them, and then everyone's stealing each other's money. And so I'm not a big fan、mm-hmm. of that card, but I do like the rest of the cards. I especially like the new cards in the new intrigue set. One of the cards I like especially is、um, Vassal, not because of the name of it,、um, but although I'm glad that the card called Vassal is not a bad card. Yeah.、Um, but this card it it costs three and it gives you two coins like a silver, and then you can f- reveal the top card of your deck and if it's an action card you play it instantly. Hmm. So that's a neat thing, right? It's it's like a silver. It's cool, but、yeah. you can flip that top card of your deck, and if it's、uh, an action card, you get to play it. I like that. You、mm. know, it gives you that chance of top decking. And there's another card I forget. I think it's called Century, which I liked a lot. It costs five, but it lets you reveal the top two cards of your deck, and then you can choose to either trash them or discard them or put them back on top of your deck.、Mm. That's very handy. Now, if you don't play Dominion, you probably don't know. What we're talking about. <laughs> However, these are good jumping points in the Dominion. You can get the base set, and both of these come with rule books that explain how all these new cards work with all the sets. So there's lists of all the different cards to do, which I actually like because I have all these lists in one book now, rather than、hmm. all the expansion books. So if you own Dominion, I think it's worth getting the upgrade just because you're going to be a sucker and buy more cards. Right. But if you don't own Dominion, it's a good chance to jump on board. And I was pretty surprised, but pleased with both Dominion Second Edition and Dominion Intrigue Second Edition. Now, how's the card quality on these new ones? You you mean that as opposed to the original ones? Yeah. How does it? Did you did you have the opportunity to mix old and new cards? Because I know the, I guess the now the last expansion. Uh, there was some grumbling about if you mix the cards together, because they they used a new printer starting with the previous expansion. I, I you know that's a good question, and I apologize that I don't know because since these were both complete sets, I mixed them with each other and played with them and didn't bother mixing it with the old cards. I didn't sit there thinking, hey, these are bad quality cards, but I didn't sit there thinking, hey, these are good quality cards. And I did comment that the box said "Made in America," and I said, "Uh oh, that's a bad sign." <laughs> Not because I'm opposed to America, everybody, but because games printed in America generally aren't as nice as ones from Germany or China. 
That's true. Uh, I'm just curious. Uh, I know that when I mixed the old and new cards with the last expansion, that it was noticeable which ones were from which set. Was it noticeable, like in your head, because you were thinking about it? Because I definitely mixed them in the last the last time I played, and I didn't notice it. Uh, it wasn't as it... much a quality issue as it was a cut issue. Like the cards were cut with a slightly different corner, and so if you had them, if you held your deck up. You could see, oh, well, that's an old card, new card, new card, old card, old card, new card, and the next three are going to be new cards. You know, okay, I understand that, and I don't like it either, and I'm not going to ever say a company should do that. I guess, though, in the end, I don't find that too bothersome because let's say I look at the top of my deck and go, oh, that's a new card? Mm. How does that change? I don't have, like, a benefit of that or anything. I guess. I, mean, so I guess it depends yes, on how I, many I, new cards you've purchased. Right, and I know somebody can probably list some sort of benefit. Well, I have a chance to draw a top card in my deck or whatever. I understand that, but if, if I'm playing with people like that, then they should find a different game. Hmm. Okay. Because I don't want to play with them. <laughs> Got it. Last for me today is Animals on Board. This is a, the Noah's Ark game from Stronghold. Uh, actually, it's not Noah's Ark because Noah has a patent on getting pairs of animals uh, whereas you are trying to get either singles or triples or quads or even groups of five. Uh, <laughs> I love this. I love this game, but they really were reaching with that theme. <laughs> it's it's a neat twist. I mean, you don't want pairs. Basically, if you get a pair, you will be you get zero. Um, and this is an I split you choose game. You start out with a whole giant array of tiles, and uh, each tile, each suit, each animal comes in one through five, I believe, is the scoring on those. Uh, and you, on your turn, either claim a set of, of these, and they are going to cost you one food for each tile in that set. So at the beginning of a round, you can't, you can't do that yet. Or you split off, you, you, you take any group and split it into two different uh, groups. Uh, it could be one tiny little split off, or it could be just directly down the middle. Let's split it in half. Whatever you do, you then get to take a food, so your buying power has increased when it gets back around to you again. Once you have claimed one of these uh, arrays, you're going to take all those tiles and put them in your arc, uh, and you are out for the rest of the round until everyone has passed, and then you'll draw some more tiles and, and restart the whole process. The game ends when somebody fills up their arc. There's, let's see, 10 slots in your arc. And then you have to, everyone has to discard down to 10, because it's possible to acquire more than 10 tiles. And then if it's a single, you get the point value that's on that, uh, that tile. And then the threes, fours, and fives get a flat rate. Uh, it doesn't matter what the numbers are on the tile. And most points wins. It is a very straightforward game. Uh, terrific for families. I played this with my folks. Uh, and uh, and I, I don't remember if my son jumped in on that or not. I think, no, it was just the adults. Uh, but it went very, very well. And uh, played super fast. Uh, very quick to explain. The bits are cute. You've got these sort of double-decker cardboard arcs, which are fun with flags that stick into them to say, I've passed for the round. The illustrations on the animals are cute because they, uh, as they age, as they go from one to five, they get bigger. So you get the little cute little baby animals uh, in the number one slot, and then they get older as they get more, uh, worth more points. Thumbs up for animals on board. I'm, I mean, it's probably a, an eight or so in my top 10, in my, uh, you know, 10 point ranking. So I'm not Jumping from the rooftops about it, but it's it's a really strong family game and and a, a big success with my parents. Animals on board. Wow, I really like eights. Your eights <laughs> must be low, man. I, I, an eight's a really good rating to give to a game. All right, that's true. Sure, I think it, I think it's also quite good. Uh, my next game I'm going to talk about is Grand Prix. This is the follow up from the Horgers and GMT games to um, Thunder Alley. Thunder Alley was based on NASCAR racing. Grand Prix is based on Formula D, Formula Motor Racing. Mm -hmm. um, Formula and, One. Formula One. Sorry, I get I get confused because I go by game names sometimes. Yes, these. exactly. I also don't know many other racers other than Mario Andretti, so I apologize on that behalf too. Just in <laughs> case Eric decides to use one of those in a future show. Lightning McQueen. Oh, I know that one. Come on now, it's Pixar, baby. Um, 
Pixar is better than all sports. Yeah, I said it. Anyhow, <laughs> so Grand Prix is about racing around a track. Um, it's kind of trying to do the same thing. In fact, the tracks and cars and different things are supposedly compatible from one to the rest. I haven't tried that out. But it's essentially the same thing. You get a couple cars and you um, are going to be moving around the board. Trying to You play a card that lets you move a car, but the cars behind you might move with you. The cars in front of you, you might push them. There's lots of drafting and following along in this game. You're zooming around the track. It is essentially the same game with some minor tweaks. They did some pit stops, which I think they, the way that they handle pit stops is much better. Every time you take damage, there's a number on it. So when you take a pit stop, you can get rid of your damage, but that number is how many spaces you move backwards to show the time you were in the pit stop. It's really good, works very well. However, I don't like it nearly as much as Thunder Alley. I think it's an okay game. I don't think it's that fun for two main reasons. Well, actually, it's the same reason. You have two cars. You also control a certain number of neutral cars. I'm just not on board with controlling the neutral cars. You use these cars to make your cars go better and go faster, but at the same time, you don't care about them. It's kind of a weird dichotomy to have. Like, oh, I'm going to use this car to help me get farther, but um, yeah, I don't want him to win. So if someone else makes one of your neutral cars not do so hot, you're not that upset, but at the same time you want you are a little upset because it's like a slave car. I don't I don't know how to explain it. I don't like it hmm. that much. And then there's neutral cars that nobody controls, but everybody can move them, and those cars end up out of the race because no one's going to make them do well at all. I I liked Thunder Alley better when all the cars were player controlled. And you had like five cars or whatever, maybe four cars or whatever. And there's also sometimes an event that will take a car out of the race. Thunder Alley, never a good thing, but sometimes it would happen because, you know, and you have four cars. Okay, now I'm down to three. When you have two cars and one of your cars just taken out of the race, you're probably not going to win. Hmm. Right? Because that means your other remaining car has to do better than everyone else's two cars. So, it's not a bad game. It's just I like the form. I like Thunder Alley better, and maybe I like NASCAR racing better than Formula Motor Racing. Jason said this felt like Formula Motor Racing. I don't know. I don't. I don't watch racing much, but I, I do like racing games a lot. And while this one was fine, I didn't think it was as spectacular as Thunder Alley. Um, small disclaimer: one of the tracks in this one is called like the Vassal Raceway in South Korea. <laughs> really. Uh, I, I think they sent me an email and asked if they could do it. And I was like, yeah, sure, I don't care. And then when I opened it up, it was a bit jarring because I had forgotten all about it. <laughs> um, but that has not affected my review of the game in any form or shape. Gotcha. That is a Grand Prix from GMT Games. All right, you ready to go mad? Let's go mad. Hey, Board Gamers, BJ from Board Game Gumbo here, back with more Louisiana Flavor. When we really want something, we say down here that we have the envie for something. It means that you have a strong desire to do something. Way back in 2006, I first heard about Carcassonne. I just had to get a copy. I had the envie to break out those meeples and tiles and play the game. It was a winner in my family, and we've played it dozens and dozens of times. So what's next? If you have the envie for the next great tile laying game, let's spice it up with Castles of Mad King Ludwig. Castles is a 2014 release from Bezier Games designed by Ted Ausbach. It's perfect for two to four players who compete to win the Mad King's favor by building out a castle. You score points by placing rooms near each other or avoiding certain combinations. And those combos, they make thematic sense. You want to put the queen's bedroom next to the king's, but maybe you don't want to put a bowling alley right next to her majesty's bedroom, right? The name of the game comes from King Ludwig II who spent all of his personal fortune building fairy tale castles in Bavaria in the late 1800s. You may not have ever been to Bavaria, but you've probably seen a version of Nischwanstein Castle, the most famous of Ludwig's creations. That castle, which you can see on the board game cover, was the real-life inspiration for Walt Disney's Sleeping Beauty's Castle at Disneyland in California. So why is Castles a spicier game than Carcassonne? Here's two reasons. First, It introduces randomized ways to get victory points through the secret bonus cards that players get during the game. 
Since they give bonuses based on the types of rooms you play, everyone tries to guess what is in your hand by the room tiles you pick. There's also randomized King's Favor cards. Those are also bonuses based on room types, but this time everybody can see what the big bonuses are. And there's so many different favorite cards included in the box that the game has a lot of replayability. But the second reason is the way that you pick up the tiles. In castles, the players don't just pick a random tile out of a stack of cards like you do in Carcassonne. Instead, each round, one player is designated the master builder, and that person sets the price of all the tiles that are available for purchase that round. That way, the master builder can try to influence players into choosing or not choosing certain tiles. And the bonus? The players pay the master builder for the privilege. Castles is my kind of game. It's got great art, fun gameplay, plays quickly, and has just enough player interaction to satisfy my Amerithrash friends. And it plays in about an hour. So if your favorite tile laying game is getting a little bland, and you have the envie to construct your very own fairy tale castle, then pick up a copy of Castles of Mad King Ludwig. I give it 4 out of 5 cayenne peppers. Until next time, laissez le bon temps rouler. And now, another tale of board gaming horror. Gather round, children. My siblings play games with me occasionally, but often they lack patience to play longer games in one sitting. I have recently been very excited about the game Alchemists, and I wanted to try the Master variant. I thought the Sukkot holiday, a week-long holiday in Israel, was a perfect time to play with them. How wrong was I? Due to a combination of slow play, people lacking patience and wanting to take a break after a while, and people having to or wanting to do other things in the holiday, the game ended up lasting for hours over the course of three days— but that's not the most horrific part. Most of the game played out normally. I got the periscope, which allowed me to gather some information from the other players, especially one of my brothers. Let's call him Bob, who did quite a lot of experiments. After a while, as we lay down some theories, Bob exclaims, What? That doesn't make any sense! We assure him that while his experiments may have crossed out these possibilities, we might still have them uncrossed, so nothing was really wrong. But as we got to the round five debunking action, our debunking attempts, partly based on Bob's exclamation, and in my case on periscope information coming from him, all fail to our surprise. Bob is last in turn order, and we already knew he plans a big debunk of two theories. And he does debunk them. Successfully. Until my other brother points out the result of his debunking experiment actually contradicts with the debunking experiment I just did. Both include the same ingredient, but one comes out as a red plus and one as a red minus. For a moment, we don't understand what happened, and then I take Bob's phone and read his game code. It's R-G-Z-Z. Everyone else's game code. The game code that was randomized at the beginning of the game and read out aloud was R-J-Z-Z. Bob misheard, and we didn't double-check it. And that simple mistake basically invalidated our entire three days game. <laughs> Always proofread, kids. <laughs> well, I, I, that's, you know, whenever the, I, I play Alchemist, I'm always like, okay, everyone has the right code, right? Right? Because yeah. for those of folks who don't understand that when you play this game, it's going to randomize what ingredients do what, and you're using a phone app. So one person just presses the button and it randomizes it, but it gives them a code. They tell everyone else to put that code in their phones, and everyone has the same randomization of ingredients. Right. Wow. Okay, so that's bad enough, right? But then the fact that the game took yeah. over three days, 
any game that takes over three days, I think, is problematic. Yes. To then have that game... It sounds like this was the wrong thing to do. And, and also to spring the master variant on them. Yeah. I don't know. I have made the mistake of, of trying... You know, I get so excited to play an expansion sometimes that uh, I, I, I make, like... Okay, so uh, the End of the Black expansion for uh, Tiny Epic Galaxies. I love the base game of Tiny Epic Galaxies, and I got sort of a preview of the of the expansion and really wanted to play it, really wanted to play it, but the group I was with had not played the base game. I said, ah, I think we can figure this out. It was a terrible idea because it just increased the the uh, the cognitive requirements exponentially in trying to teach both the base game and the expansion at the same time. And and stuff that I felt really, you know, I totally understand how this works. Just getting the basics down was difficult, and adding all of this extra stuff was a terrible idea. Not a good thing. Yeah, I know it's exciting so, you want to play a new expansion, but make sure the people who are at the table can handle it. Right. Almost always. There are a few expansions that can be just thrown in, but usually, 90% of the time, you really don't want to throw an expansion into the mix until everyone is very comfortable with the base game. Hmm. But that was only one piece of the problem in this particular instance. All right, well, let's get to another game that can be long if you play with seven players and Cold of the Old. Welcome to Cult of the Old, where I discuss games we may have forgotten about or games that failed miserably but still had some good mechanics in it. He's Brian Counter, and everything he does is counterproductive. This week I wanted to talk about Sleuth, which came out when I was four years old, and yes, we had cars. Developed by Sid Saxon in 1971, rated rank 6.9 and 814 on Board Game Geek. Sleuth is a puzzly deduction game, and the line is a clue, or clue do as they call it across the pond, but done just with cards, no roll and move boards, and I'm assuming, without hearing a board game bio segment, <clears throat> that Sid developed this because some of the parts of Clue were kind of... Not all that great. So he took the cool parts of Clue, discarded the crappy parts of Clue, and came up with Sleuth. In Sleuth, there are 36 cards. There are three types of jewels, opals, diamonds, pearls. They come in ones, twos, and threes, and there are four different colors. There go, 36 unique cards. To start the game, players will take one of those unique cards, put them off to the side, and the winner is the one who could identify the card. The rest of the cards are dealt face down evenly across all players, and any leftovers are dealt face up in the middle of the table, so everyone will have a certain number of clues that they know that are not the card they're seeking. The game also comes with hobbit-sized clue cards of one or two traits. If there is a single trait on it, like diamonds, you get to ask one player how many diamond cards they have in their hand, and they tell you and the rest of the board, but don't show you any cards. If it's a clue card with two traits on it, for example, blue diamonds, they tell the board how many cards they're showing, you and they show you the cards. You can mark them off on your check boxes and you move on and people try and garner as much information from that exchange without seeing the cards as they can. There are also cards that let players determine one of the traits on their own, which helps a lot. Note that sometimes not being shown any cards can be more helpful than actually being shown some cards. Play continues around the table until someone says they have it, they circle it on their spreadsheet, and they look at the card. If they're correct, they win. If not, they're out, and play continues around the table until someone gets the right card. While this game can be played family style in simple form, the beauty of this game is a depth which is deceptive. When you get brain-burning people in this game who can handle a lot of details, this is a pretty cool intellectual battle at puzzle-solving, deduction, and just brain-burning goodness. This is a much deeper game than it looks like on the surface. I'll grant you this doesn't have the flashy magpie goodness of the cult of the new stuff. However, there's a good game in here. One caveat here, though. Do not play this as your closer. The last time I played this, we started at 9.45. After a heady game, my brain was mush. I'm a reasonably intelligent person, but the people I play with are smarter than I, and after a hard day at work of coding all day, playing this at 9.45 at night was a bad idea for me. I don't need to win, but my brain was just mush, and I got rolled over, so don't play this as your closer. Past that, good times. You can still find pretty cheap copies of this game. Like I said, not a bunch of flash, but this is a substantive game, so if that piques your interest, consider checking out Sleuth. 
Mr. 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 Tom, uh, can you comment on the latest Essen releases? Where do you keep all your ties? If I threw water at you during a game, would you yell at me? And now Tom, the dice tower will authoritatively, have... definitely, possibly, really maybe, answer your questions. I, I, uh, Tom, uh, oh, which way to the bathroom? Ryan has another question about legacy games. Uh, Ryan's curious if the trend of legacy games continues... Will you still be devoting the same amount of time in reviewing these types of games? I remember you mentioning that you won't revisit games upon request from publishers and the like. Many games have different scenarios that play out differently with each gameplay just because of the design of the game. How is this different than a legacy game series of gameplays that is played to the end? Specifically, I'm thinking of Seafall, which does not sound like a stellar game in your opinion, but is obviously going to be played until the end because it is a legacy game. However, the feel of a standard game can change drastically between game plays. So what is it fair, or so is it fair, to base a valid review on one gameplay? Just a thought as I'm being the devil's advocate. If more games pursue the legacy trend, will as much time be spent on reviewing those types of games? Obviously, with a number one game being a legacy game, this should warrant more attention to those types of games, at least for the coming future. I just have found a lot of games that I have initially hated just because when I played it, the scenario played out was not fun. But then I have replayed the same game after much pressure and have had an incredible experience just because of the way the scenario played out. Most of these games I ended up losing drastically the second time, but still had a much better time. So this went a different direction than I had expected the question to go. Hmm. I thought they were saying, why are you playing these lazy games at the end? But now they're using it as justification to say you should play a regular game as many times as you play a legacy game. I think that's the question, yes. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the big thing there is uh, I think that if I don't get a regular game and don't understand it, uh, then I'm going to play it more. Mm-hmm. But a regular game is not going to change from game to game. A legacy game does. But I want to be clear. Again, I'm, 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 I'm trying not to rant every time this comes up. But legacy games, there's so few of them. We, we keep like lumping the well, legacy games. There is currently three of them. They're all designed by the same guy. <laughs> there's a fourth one. I think Gloomhaven is about to come out. I'm not really sure what, where that one lands. Although I've seen the box for that one, and it's frightening. Mm-hmm. Did you see the box of it, Eric? I did. It's gigantic. Yeah, it's very frightening. But here's the thing. I'm giving Seafall a chance to the end, not because it's a legacy game, although that's part of it. You know, I want to see what's going to happen. But because Rob Davio, who was involved in Pandemic Legacy and Risk Legacy, exceeded my expectations in those games. Hmm. And you know what? That may not be fair to a new designer who, if I play a legacy game they've done, and after three or four games, it's blah, and I'm like, well, you know what? Forget that. But that's the way it is. He's built my trust up that he has surprises up his sleeve. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where it is. Now, if we start getting tons of legacy games, yeah, we're not going to play them all all the way through because I don't have 40, 50 hours to devote to every single game that comes out. And even Seafall... Uh, we were going to play it tomorrow as of this recording, and we weren't able to get that together, so now we're going to play it next week. We are going to play it, and we may finish it, but it's going to take, it could take a year possibly at this point. Mm. Ben likes the Dice Tower, and he wants to know about, he saw pictures of the Dice Tower library, wants to know how we transport it, because we saw these large cases on wheels. They appear to be suitable for display as well as transporting. I've not been able to find anything on the internet that is similar. Now, I, I, I don't own the Dice Tower Library or, or transport it, but it seems kind of weird that you can't find bookcases with wheels. Hmm. These are just rolling racks. Yeah. Um, they come with covers on them. Uh, they have them at the Dice Tower convention. They put covers on them. They zip the covers up. They put them on a truck, and they go store them somewhere. When it's time to bring them out, they just bring them right out. Unzip them and boom, you have it. It's a really right. cool thing. Yeah, and they, they didn't start out that way. That's uh, a new addition in the last couple of years, right? I believe I want to say yeah, two years ago they started doing it this way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Before that, they just brought them in in things and unpacked them and put them on the shelf. But these are better. I want to say that um, 
the Cavs libraries was using these now too, weren't they? Uh, they had some sort of rolling carts. I don't know if they're the same design as what we've had the last couple of years. Now we're actually going to be redoing these carts um, for uh, Dice Tower Cruise. Instead of taking the whole library, we're just going to take the hottest games. Hmm. So that's what I know. Lars is asking, uh, since uh, there's been many years since the Euro wave of board games, he suspects the divide between European games and American games has become narrower. Do you still see significant differences in board game design, like themes, mechanisms, number and rate of expansions, etc., between European designers and publishers and American designers and publishers? I... <sighs> Do you, do you think you agree with me that it's not so much where the game is made anymore as oh, in the style not. of the game? Right. It, it's, it's its own – I don't think you can really draw distinct lines between these two. It's a gradient for one thing. And it's not based on location. It's based on what style of game the producer is trying to make. Yeah. I think the most Amerithrash games I know right now are coming from Poland. Mm-hmm. You know, and now, I mean, but when I play a Euro game, I'm like, oh, it's a Euro game, but some of those are made by Tasty Minstrel, which right. is an American publisher. Eh, it doesn't matter. Uh, we call them that because that's where they started, and I don't know how long we'll call them that. I know that commenters like me are keeping these terms alive, but I don't think it's a big deal. There's so many hype. I mean, I was commenting when we were at Essen. There was just so many different style of games there. It wasn't dominated by the so-and-so, so, you know, quote-unquote, Euro games. There were party games there, kids games, uh, you know, war games, dexterity games. Any kind of game you can think of it was there, mm -hmm. including well, bad games. Yeah. <laughs> Lars continues with a second question. Uh, he lives in Denmark, and going to Gen Con is a very expensive proposition for him, while Essen is a much more accessible endeavor. Barring the fact that Gen Con also has a lot of non-board game related stuff that he could be interested in, like miniatures or RPGs, do you think the differences between the two largest conventions are so big that I'd regret not going to Gen Con sometime? They definitely are different. There's yes. no question in my mind that they're different. At the same time, if you live in Denmark, that's an expensive thing to come. You know, yeah. I talked about um, Board Game Breakfast this uh, a couple weeks ago. I was talking about uh, the differences between the two conventions, and I mentioned that if you live in Europe, you should go to that Essen, and if you live in Germany, I mean, if you live in America, you should go to Gen Con because of cost. You know, that's certainly something you should take into effect. And someone said, well, duh, uh, obviously you're going to go to the one that's cheaper. Well, you can say that, well, duh, but people don't think that sometimes. Right. And I'm like, nah, because I've met people before. They're like, every gamer should go to Essen at least once. <laughs> no, you, you don't have to do that. You'll be okay. Same thing with Gen Con. And I, and I, I always believe that. Sure, I like going to them, but I, I don't think you're going to miss out. Just find an, a, a convention and get involved in a close one if you can, and you'll have so much more fun at that. Mm -hmm. I love Gen Con and Essen, and we had great times at both of them, but neither one of them is going to be my favorite convention of the year. And it's not even close. I had a great time at both of them, but my favorite conventions are more intimate, smaller conventions, for mm -hmm. sure. I still really like the vibe at Essen. That, that's, uh, I, I, for whatever reason, I really appreciated that this year. I think what my usual uh, rule of thumb when somebody says, Do, should I go to Essen? Should, should I... I say, do you want to experience Europe and not just a board game convention? Because you can get a board game convention in a lot of places. But to get that European filter on it and maybe do some sightseeing in Europe at the same time, yes, do it once. But the amount of games that, you, that are going to be exclusive to either of those conventions aren't that high of a percentage of all of the games released there. Most things you will be able to get on the other side of the pond at some point. And I think the same does apply to Gen Con for European listeners, too. That most of the games should be available in Europe at some point. Um, there are exceptions. For example, a lot of people coming to ask about Onitama. Uh, I guess it's difficult to get over there. Hopefully that'll change in the next year or so. Um, but 
that percentage, I, th- I still think, is relatively low. So if all you want to do is go board game shopping, I think you're okay not, not going that far uh, to, to visit the other convention. But if you want to experience the different filter on a game convention, do some sightseeing, see what Indianapolis has to offer, or other areas in the Midwest, yes, it's, it's a worthwhile trip. Just don't make it the only focus. Last question from Lars, uh, who's watched and listened to the Dice Tower for a number of years, still goes back and listens to and watches older reviews of games, previous top 10 lists, etc. And sometimes he'll just wait a couple of weeks before watching a video because of other stuff he has to do. He often feels compelled to comment on something, but was wondering if we still read and maybe even reply to comments weeks, months, or even years after a video has been put out, or if you have a general time frame when you read replies. I try to read replies every day. I try to read every reply to our videos. I don't always do that. There is a lot of them, and I'm a speed reader, but it is hard to keep up with that. Uh, I I definitely cannot and will not respond to every comment. It's just impossible. I know some other uh, video people do respond to every comment, but we honestly get so very many. Uh, so, well, I guess we don't get so many, but I'm looking here, and let's see, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12, we got about 13, 14, 15, we got 15 comments here in two hours. Hmm. Now that may not seem like a lot, right? We'll, we'll just say 14, that's seven, seven per hour, but seven per hour times 24 is 150 comments a day. That, that really adds up fast to type out 150 sentences is a lot. Yeah. And in a meaningful way. So I, I just – I don't necessarily. Um, but at the same time, I do keep an eye on them and I might respond to something old. But I don't normally respond to old stuff because if someone comments there, I normally am thinking, well, who's still watching that or reading that old old show anyway? Mm-hmm. I'll often uh, – like I, I put a subscription on Board Game Geek for uh, – you know, episode titles. So when the show notes go up in our forums, I will subscribe to that thread. And, and yeah, there's usually a, a, some discussion for the first week or two. But it's kind of neat to see an older episode pop up in the feed uh, and, uh, and somebody commenting on something that happened a few months ago. So I still pay attention to those. All right. We have a question from Steve, and he says there's a review of a game, and he goes and looks up and finds out it's a Kickstarter game. And he's not entirely happy with a lot of games going that route, although he understands why they do it, as he feels the games are not as polished, especially in the components. Um, when he says he says he says if he does see a game that he's interested in, he finds out the project is over, there's no chance to buy it, or they're offering another chance to buy it, and it'll be months before it's released. Is there a way to mention um, that it's a Kickstarter project and the release date? One of the reasons I'm not backing Kickstarter games, says Steve, are the ridiculous and never-ending stretch goals. I think you feel the same way, but I'd love to see someone say, this is our game, pick your backer level, and that's it. No stretch goals. Just put it all in to begin with and raise the price or do an expansion later. Hmm. All right, well, a couple things there. First of all, about the Kickstarter things, I'm not really sure what you're asking there about. Is there a way to mention? He wants in your video reviews to say this was a Kickstarter project. First of all, I'm not always sure if things are Kickstarter projects or not. Um, I'd have to actually go look up the game on the internet, type in the word Kickstarter, and hope they find that Kickstarter project. Because the Kickstarter website is one of the worst searchable websites on earth. Hmm. I hate their searching on the Kickstarter website. I have to use KickTrack, which is a marvelous website. Hmm. That's Kick T R A Q to search Kickstarter. Kickstarter is just awful. Awful. Hmm. Boo. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I'm just really I, – I've been doing some Kickstarter searching lately, and it's really frustrating. Uh, understandable. Um, but the uh, – so – and having these dates and all that, it's just very – it's a lot of work to hunt this down. Publishers are really bad at keep out giving us information about when things come out or when they don't. Even like – some people are like, well, when's this game coming out? Well, I think in a week, but I'm not sure. Hmm. 
you know, we never find out this information. So I, I really don't think you should say, was it kickstarted? I will or will not buy it based on that alone. That seems kind of limiting. Yeah, I understand what he's saying. You know, as a on a whole, on or on average, uh, Kickstarter projects tend to have lower quality components because the publishers are doing it for the first or second time, and and have not yet learned all of the lessons that they need to learn as far as getting the proper components and working with the right suppliers and all of that sort of thing. Uh, I understand so- that, but in the review. I don't care if it's Kickstarter or not. I'm going to tell you if the components are good quality or not. Or, right. You know what I mean? And you can see how it works. So what does it matter whether it was on Kickstarter or not? True. As far as the stretch goals, um, I mean, that's that's totally a marketing thing, right? That's to sort of in, keep the excitement of the project going on throughout the course of the project. It's part of a subculture that's evolved around Kickstarter you could not do it, right? You could be a publisher and say, I am not going to take free money. <laughs> and that's that's bad business tactics, really. I mean, not putting stretch goals at this point in time is tantamount to basically saying, I don't want to get extra money at the end. Because for good or for bad, they work. They definitely work. Um, so I'm not a big fan maybe of necessarily – I like the stretch goals to be not add 6,000 things to the game. It is kind of weird. Like I just, I have a game on its way right now. I just got the shipping notice, and the company decided to send me the stretch goal enhanced one. And there's like 20 items on the list. I'm like, I just wanted to play the game. Mm. I don't need the rollout play mat and the special binder and the artwork signed. And I'm not saying that's what's coming with this game, but you know what I mean. The, some of these games come with so much stuff. And I mean, Coleman here not does that, right? Hey, you buy the game, also 6,000 expansions with it. <laughs> yeah, you that comes in a separate box. that people got like with the others. It was like a whole giant box full of stuff. Right. But I don't know that – I don't know what's going to change. Why would they not do that? And again, why would that bother you if they did it or not? If you go in there and see what you're getting without the stretch goals and you'd like that, then back it. Right. Ryan asks about uh, designers rating their own games. Ryan's had a couple of designs uh, that are listed on BoardGameGeek, and he's seen other designers rate their games, but Ryan has hesitated to do that. Is rating your own game a faux pas? Yes. Yes, it is. I'm going to look to see... I'm going to look to see if I've rated my own game. Did you? <laughs> I it, don't know. I mean, what what it comes across as, especially if it's one of the first few reviews for a game, it it comes across as shilling, for lack of a better word, uh, trying to skew the ratings in a positive direction, especially if you've rated it highly. You know, a lo- there's so many games where the designer has gone on and put a ten on it. And says, this is a great game. It's like, well, but it's your game. I can't believe your opinion. If you want to make a comment on your game, you can place a rating or or a comment rating without putting a number associated with it. I think that would be fine. You you started off with, say, just so you know, I'm the designer, and here are my thoughts. Here's the strength that I think this game has. I designed it for such and such a player. I hope you enjoy it. That's useful information. More of a designer note than a rating but don't put a number on that thing i i don't think that I, that just can't be received very well all right well i did not write nothing personal but i did write um vicious fishes you did yeah it says it's rated a, a seven but i changed it to a six okay <laughs> but eric just said i was bad about for rating my own game i don't feel that bad i you didn't know, even I, give it that high of a rating if you if you give it a six i don't think it makes a difference but Usually, this sort of thing is is a 10. I mean, there have been plenty of quote-unquote scandals on Board Game Geek where designers or or uh, accounts associated with the designer have rated a game highly. Uh, what I mean, what was the game? The uh, the pyramid chess or chess pyramids. Card chess. Cross, crossroad. Card chess. Crossword pyramids. That was it. Um, that uh, that that had a bunch of shill accounts. A bunch of individual board game geek accounts that were all rating their game highly in an effort to drive up the average rating. And people discovered it and, and gave them, I think, deserved flack for it. It's it's just not cool. 
Don't do it. I'm sorry, Eric. Just don't I, I don't do it. I don't I honestly don't care as much as Eric does. I, I, I think that might be cheesy to go and rate your own game of 10, but it doesn't change anything. If someone goes in and sees your one single rating and goes, oh, I guess I should get the game, come on, do some more research. Um, and one person's rating can't change the ratings that much. Board Game Geek has algorithms in place. You know, you could have 20 of your friends all go in and rate it as a 10, and they would catch that. Hmm. They're pretty good at catching these things. They, they are. So they're, I, they're a lot better than they were, you know, 10 years ago. I, I just remember going, what was it? Fantasy Stables, that game about horses. I went in to rate that game a four, and somebody was in there giving it a ten. Obviously the designer. Okay, that's fine, though, but that's still not necessarily a bet. Who cares if someone else gives it a ten if they are the designer? Again, people shouldn't be basing it off one rating that they saw. I guess. Two thumbs up, says uh, the Wichita Press. <laughs> Why they couldn't get Chicago Tribune and the, all the other big papers? Now nah, I probably just irritate the people in Wichita. You did Podunk City. I mean, that's Tom Vassell at gmail dot com. All right, last question from Joe. He's been getting into board games lately, and he likes watching our reviews and stuff. But he wants to know about Dice Town. He's heard us talk about the game and how much we like it, but he doesn't recall seeing it on our top one hundred lists. Does this game cross the mind when making lists, or is there something that does not draw you to play the game that much more often? He's only seen it on the top ten dice games. He was one- curious why it was not on more lists. I don't you like it go? that much. Oh, you don't? No, this is... Uh, I've, I've only played it once or twice, but I was not a fan of the poker dice mechanism. I didn't like it. Okay, well, A, Eric's crazy. Okay. But B, there are... I have currently played 5,000 games-ish. So the top 100 is one out of every 50 games makes my list for the top 100. So many games that are amazing games that – let's let's look at the games we talked about in this episode that I liked. Uh, Grand Prix, I, I like that game, but that's not making my top 100. Um, well, let's, let's go to the last episode. Great Western Trail and Adrenaline. Those are both great games. And Isle Bound, all three of those were great games I mentioned last episode. But I don't know if any of them are going to make my top 100. They might, but there's only so much room. That's all. There's nothing more than that. Uh, you gotta, I, I, I do mention this actually in every top 100 list now that I only have room for 100, but people put a lot of stock in that. I, I, I wish you wouldn't put as much stock in that. Because it's not that big of a deal if a game's not on that list. Look at my initial review. Did I say I liked it a lot? Then I liked it a lot. Doesn't matter what list it's in. Also, ignore Eric's opinion on it. Seriously, <laughs> Eric, you don't like this game? It's an amazing game. Uh, I'm fine. I'm, I'm happy you enjoy it. Yeah, but I'm not happy if you don't enjoy it. Because I only derive pleasure if everyone agrees with me on everything. I'm, I'm sorry? Watch, someone's going to cut that clip and use it as an actual... Yes, someone might do that. Nah, you're too lazy. Yeah, That's probably. Fun. Let's get under the hood and see what makes one of our favorite games tick with a board game biopsy. Hello, I'm Jackie, and welcome again to Gaming Biopsy. Today, I'm going to take you back in time to look at a 1995 Rhino Nizia game called Medici. The game has been around for 20 years, but the new edition was just put out by Grail Games. It is by far the prettiest and therefore the most playable um, version of the game so far. Medici is considered by many, and with good reason in my opinion, the quintessential auction game. It is also the best game by Nizia, with one exception that I will touch upon in the future, if you ask me. In Medici, or Medici as you hear it pronounced uh, from time to time, players take turns being the auctioneer, adding items to a pool, until either they are satisfied or until they reach three, which is the maximum number of items you can offer. This is done in older version by pulling tiles from a bag, in the new version by drawing cards from a deck, and you offer that up for auction to the other players, each as one um, 
occasion to offer, one opportunity to offer before you do the final bid and determine if you get it or not. The interesting thing that distinguishes the auctions in Medici from auctions in real life is that, and this is the great intuition by the good Dr. Nizia, in real life adding items of little to no value to an auction of pool would increase likely or be insignificant to this peculiar lot. In Medici instead, given that you can only gain five items each round and there are three big rounds in the game, adding stuff to an auction actually limits the value of that lot because if the items that you win are not what you need they will take away space that you would have reserved for things you actually needed. On top of that two important elements contribute to make this game most tasteful and therefore most delicious. On the one hand the points are money meaning while it is a sack collection game you are spending the very thing that you're trying to gain. So there is a very strong consideration of how much can I spend to get what I want. On top of that, there are two main scoring, beside not spending a lot of money, which can be very interesting. On the one hand, you're trying to set collect at the end of each of the three rounds in the game. Points are awarded for whoever has the most or the second most tiles in a specific color. There are six colors in the game. I say tiles, actually you can accrue points that stays from round to round, but they correspond to the tiles you gain in each round. On top of that though, the total value of the boat is scored and that can give you a lot of points. However, the two things are not directly related, which means that getting a zero and a one green is better than getting a five green if your goal is to get majority in green because you get two tiles instead of one but of course zero and one adds to one while a five contributes way more to the total value of your boat. The dynamic tension between these two ways of scoring is what makes the decisions interesting and therefore elevates auction to a whole new level in this very tense, very interesting game by Ryder Nizia. I suggest you check it out. Thank you for listening. This has been Jackie with Gaming Biopsy. See you soon. It's time for the Dice Towers Question of the Week, sponsored by Cool Stuff Inc., in which our team of gaming experts answers one of your questions, thus increasing the odds that someone will get it right. This week's question Is there a distinct difference between sports and games? Hi guys, this is Glenn from The Sweet Spot, and yes, there is a difference. Athletics have been refined to the point where you can have the ultimate expression of it, and I can really only say that about chess. Now, I don't see a grandmaster playing in the NBA anytime soon, and neither do I see LeBron being the next Bobby Fischer. But outside of that, athletics require instinctual reflex. You have split seconds to make decisions. There always is time to debate something in a game. That would probably be the biggest difference. Hello, hello. Ignace Tuchek, Portal Games. And Stephen Bonacore, Stronghold Games. We are Board Games Insider. And the question of the week is, if there is a distinct difference between sports and games, for me, games, when I play, I play them for social for uh, fun, for entertainment, and when I play football, and I play football every single week on Mondays, I play to win. Like, I'm super dedicated to winning when I play on, on a pitch. For games, I can lose, and I still will have a fun. I think there's a very big difference, and uh, obviously there's all kinds of athletic things that go on in sports, and uh, no, chess is not a sport, it's a, it's a game. So, yes, very big difference. This is Brian from Cult of the Old, and in my perspective, yes, there's a very distinct difference between sports and games. I seem to be of that uncommon breed who played as a youth in baseball, football, and in college intramural soccer and football. Loved every minute of it. I didn't say it was any good. The only year I started in football, we only won one game that year. But there's a level of competition in sports that you don't have in gaming. In sports, there's a whole lot of testosterone for guys and a stronger desire to win. If I play with really competitive people in board gaming, I won't play with them for very long because it's not what I'm after. Uh, That actually turns me way off. Board gaming is fun amongst friends, and you try to win, but you're there to have a good time. 
sports, you wanted to win, and you were way more aggressive about it, even if you weren't trying to be a jerk about it. It's Roy Candy from Epic Gaming Night, and normally when you think of sports, you think of physical exertion. But with the rise of esports, there's a huge following and big teams that have to work and practice very hard to try to get these teams off the ground. League of Legends, the World Championship, has a prize pool of $2 million, and Hearthstone, which is very much like a tabletop game, has a prize pool on their World Championship of a $1 million. Even in Magic the Gathering, you can get $70,000 if you are the world champion. So there's huge amounts of money and huge teams and lots of practice that goes into these esports and even card games with Magic. I think with strong competition, you can definitely call any game a sport. But for me, I'd like to keep it on the casual level and stay as far away from that as I can. This is Professor Scott Rogers of Biography of a Board Game. And the question is, is there a distinct difference between sports and games? Well, duh, nobody paints their face and takes off their shirt when playing board games, actually. What I teach in my courses is that the difference between the two is sports tend to gravitate towards the physical, where board games gravitate towards the mental. Now, there are things like pitch car, which is a physical activity, and some sports are much more mental, like fencing or... Um, well, that's all I can think of. But anyway, yeah, there's a, a huge difference between them um, because uh, there are jocks and nerds. So there you go. That's the answer. Uh, some interesting discussion there. Uh, I, I don't think that these uh, terms are mutually exclusive. In my mind, sports are games by definition. They're just games that have a higher level of competition, have a, a, a more rigid structure. Uh, they, they have spectators, often monetary rewards, but they are games. Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. What about like uh, if you're just running? That's a sport. I could say I'm running. But if there's no game involved, there's, there's, it's possible to run and have no game involved. Who, who can run the fastest? No, no, not who can run, but if I'm out running just for my own health and Well, that's a, that's and a fitness activity. And that's not a sport. I think sports require think rule. Would... Until you enter some sort of event that has a structure to it, it's not a sport. It's an athletic activity. I don't know. Uh, I, mean, I guess the, the sport of rock climbing... But there are competitive rock climbers as well. In my mind, you need to Anything have a competition. Anything in the world could be made competitive. But painting a fence could be competitive. Who can paint it faster? That doesn't make it a sport. Competitive painting. Yeah. <laughs> That's not a thing. I just made it up. Sounds like, sounds like uh, fun. Or is it a thing? <laughs> yeah. Tom Sawyer is really <laughs> fun. Um, I... I the, 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 it's always these crossover things. Like, is is bocce ball is that is that a is that a sport or right. is it a game? Is pool a sport or a game? Is darts a sport or a game? It's like blurry. What about crokinole? Is that a sport or a game? When does it become a a? What, I mean, how do you know if it's a tabletop game? Does it have to be on a table? <laughs> pool is on a table. It is. And Crokinole and um, Carome are on tables, but they're pretty big. And air hockey is on a mm -hmm. table, but I don't think most people would call air hockey a board game. Although if you ever want to play me in air hockey, I'll whoop you in it. <laughs> I challenge everyone. I'm challenging you all. Uh, but you have to pay because air hockey is expensive. Right, yes, unless you get your own table. I always wanted one of the cool Japanese ones with the triple pox and four players. Ooh, I played one one time where the, the hole in air hockey was like six inches in front, like a like a real hockey arena. Hmm. So the puck could go around it in the back. I really like that one. That's cool. I've seen one with mini pucks, too. That's cool. Ah, oh, man. Did you see the, the triple player clask at, at Essen? That was neat. I played that. That was fun. Oh man, you're, I'm so jealous. That was. Did you win? Uh, we we didn't really keep score. We just did sort of a free for all. Let's score a bunch of goals on each other. I think we actually talked about this in our live show. Maybe. Uh, we didn't talk about it the live show. We we did just chat about it. I said the ball was too small. They needed a larger, larger ball or larger pucks. Hmm. Anyway, well, it was for okay, but that's the kind of thing. Like class, is it a board game or a sport? It's people, you know what? I, I, I don't, I don't honestly care. I just felt like it'd be a fun question to ask. But I think the large think, version is a sport. The small, regular version is a, a, a tabletop board game. 
All right, folks, what do you think? What's the difference between a sport and a game? How do you know? When do you determine whether we should, you know, something fits in the category of things we talk about? Can Eric and I talk about curling? Is curling a, 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 a game? Curling's a sport. Um, curling's a sport. Curling's a sport. Ah. <sighs> I think Token actually this you. was the topic Cy of the Young. first or second episode of Ludology, if I remember correctly. Nolan Ryan, Roger Clemens, Pete Fenson, Trammell, Pete Rose, so many players. So I little know. time. And you picked a tennis player. Sure. All right, folks. Well, that is our episode on sports. You know what? As we were doing this episode in the last 20 minutes, I believe jet lag came and knocked on my door. Did it really? <laughs> So yeah, we need that, to that happens end. at weird times for me at the moment. Well, folks, we do appreciate you listening. We will be back next week with another episode. So until then, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Eric Summerer. And you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode number 481 was recorded on October 20th, 2016. Coming up next week, it's our top 10 next step games. This podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassell Memorial Fund is dedicated to providing support to members of the board gaming community in their hour of need. Our annual auction is live. Find it at BoardGameGeek or by visiting jackvassell.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom and me, with assistance from Jason Thompson, Itai Perez, Eric Matthews, and Rob Searing. Urban dessert planning provided by City of Pies. Timothy Pinkham composed our theme, and hosting is provided by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games at great prices at CoolStuffInc.com. Let us know what you think of the show by posting to the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, following the Dice Tower on Twitter, or by emailing us at Dicetower at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network, including Boards and Swords, Flip the Table, On Board Games, The Party Game Cast, Board Games Insider, and Board Game University. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun. Game. Is ping pong a game? No, ping pong's a sport. Have you seen those guys in competitive ping pong? They they make me weep because I used to be proud at how good how good I was getting. Um, yeah, 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 and and like competitive badminton. That's also crazy crazy time. Unbelievable. Oh yeah, I think anything could be a sport. I only derive pleasure if everyone agrees with me on everything. <laughs>